Hope everyone's having a good time so far. You got your swag ready? Everyone got their swag, everyone? Hopefully. I'm Rodrigo. I am uh, I'm one of the advisors at the uh, Tampa Bay IEC Squared chapter. Um, I'm an information security engineer, if you don't know me. I work for Mangin. Uh, I have a few colleagues in here already um, attending as well. Um, this was last minute, so I didn't have time to prepare to introduce our speaker here, but um, so I'm going to be looking at my phone. Um, this is Dave Vargas. Uh, he's a lead uh, uh, security consultant at VATG Inc. Um, uh, in his spare time, he teaches cybersecurity at several colleges in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Dave graduated with magna cum laude from the Washington University, University and has completed graduate work in information systems at John Hopkins University. Um, his current certifications include CEH, CISSP, and uh, CISM. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic. Right, thank you, Rodrigo. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you for that intro. I'm going to do my own introduction because, frankly, I think it's funnier. So I've been doing this for 20 years, right? And, uh, yeah, I really feel that way. Oh, God, I, you know, please let me retire sometime soon. I have an 8 and a 9-year-old. I don't know how long, you know, and I'm 56, so I don't know whether that's going to really happen. Um, uh, I've been teaching network and cybersecurity for over 20 years, I like to say, because I like talking to people who don't pay any attention. <laughs> uh, I've done a lot of training. I actually started in, uh, in information security in the Navy. I was attached to, uh, to the Navy at the National Security Agency, which back then nobody ever talked about. We called it no such agency. Now it's in the news almost every day now. Um, and I worked for a flag officer there. I've actually done Army counterintelligence training. Anybody here who's in the Army? Army? So cool. I love the Army. Um, uh, I got to, I guess, learn how to follow people and interview people. But I think we called it interviewing. It, there was no waterboarding at the time, but we learned how to interview people. Um, and that was lots of fun. But uh, I, I've done a lot of that training, and I had to say here, what can I say? It was free. You know, you had to be in the military to do it. Uh, personal, um, I'm married to a, a super hot and sexy wife from Guatemala. She forced me to say this. Uh, four extremely attractive and intelligent children. Obviously, they don't take after their father. And I'm an active member of a Seventh-day Adventist church in Virginia. And when you're in cyber, you tend to pray a lot. At least in my case, I don't know about you. <laughs> she's not. She's a citizen. Don't assume she's not a citizen. She, she's actually a senior security engineer for Jamalto, if anybody knows Jamalto. Yeah, she's a citizen. Uh, I don't know where your mind is going with that one. All right, so this is going to be the rough introduction for this uh, presentation. Please, um, you want to interject? Interject. If you hear something you don't like, tell me. Just don't throw anything. And if you do, I'm pretty quick, so I'll probably be able to dodge it. Um, but uh, you know, I'd rather have this as kind of a, as a conversation, uh, a back and forth. I'm not going to read every little uh, bullet on the slide. I'm just going to, you know, because it's so big. And if you do want access to the presentation, just let me know after the seminar. I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, but uh, I want to uh, start off with an informal survey. How many of you use a, a voice control technology? My guess is it's like at least 90% of you, right? Uh, hi. Yeah, it's a very high number. Okay. How many of you own an Amazon Echo uh, Dot Show? Wow. Okay. That's a pretty good number. Very good. Good. Um, how many of you enjoy your voice-based assistant? Like it? Uh, not as many hands went up. Look at that. Those of you who enjoy it, why do you enjoy it? Hey, go ahead. Ease of use? You, know, you don't have to get up, right? Yeah. Keeps you company? Keeps you company? Is your device doing something my device doesn't? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think people are moving to it because of the easy. I love having, not having to get up and just yell, Alexa, what time is it? I gave an, uh, an Amazon Echo to my parents who are in their 70s, and they, you know what they use it for? To take naps. Alexa, wake me up in 15 minutes. That's actually, and you know what? I think that's okay. I mean, if they're happy with it, then I think that's an awesome application of the technology. Um, how many of you are concerned about the potential security vulnerabilities of voice-based assistance? Yeah, okay. Well, hopefully we're going to be able to shatter some myths uh, today on that. So let's do a quick introduction and make sure you understand what a, a voice-based as assistant is, right? It's basically using language um, to provide services to users through voice recognition application. So the things that we used to be able to tap for or type for, now we could basically just um, say a verbal command. And um, I don't know about you, but probably, I know this sounds silly, but the things I ask, uh, use my voice assistant for are probably the silliest things. I have a family of four kids, so I very frequently have to ask Alexa to play classical music to calm me down, okay? <laughs> um, things like weather. Um, things like, what time is it? My kids cheat each other at Pokemon, so the one that can't add so well is doing his math, math on, you know, Alexa saying, Alexa, how much is 25 plus 25, for example? All right. 
or minus two. I haven't had to do minus yet. That's only when I'm doing my checkbook. Um, but you know, the thing <laughs> about the Amazon, though, uh, Echo, you know, we're using it in a consumer-oriented way. But you know what? This technology is going to wind up in our workplace, right? You know, you're reading now more and more frequently. It's entering our cars, right? You know, one of the research studies I read, you know, it was in the Audi. You know, Alexa was in the Audi. Um, Ford announced it was going to put it in its cars. And there are going to be more and more applications, not only consumer-based, but also in the business space, which is why it concerns me, because it's my job to secure um, uh, business-type organizations, not consumers, OK? Um, so uh, when it, I'm going to be focusing on the Echo only because it's, we only have, what, 45 minutes and there's not a lot of technologies I can focus on. Um, but these are some of your other options. Probably most of our first introduction to uh, um, voice-based assistants, I would guess it'd probably be Siri. Would, I, would, you, would that be a fair statement for most of us, at least on your mobile device? Um, now even Samsung has uh, its own voice-based assistant called Bixby. Anybody have a Samsung device using Bixby? Oh, do you use Bixby by any chance? No big, okay. <laughs> Any particular reason why? Not? Okay, okay, cool, cool, yeah. But you know, so it turns out that every uh, major manufacturer in IT is gonna come out with some version of it. And I think you've seen this if you have your Apple Siri where they're nice enough to tell you all the things you can ask um, the Siri to do. Um, this is some examples of the, the top of an Amazon Echo. And um, I like this slide because it showed, it's kind of like some of the new features that were being added. And you'll see here on the bottom right it says turn off the lights. And really that's what's happening. So we're moving to this smart home. Now, I'm asking this question because I know you're all cybersecurity professionals, right? How many of you have a smart home? OK, cool. Um, despite all the security concerns of the smartphone, you have it. And I think that's really interesting because I understand the security problems of this stuff. I've been doing this for a long time. But you know what? The, the, the use case is so compelling. How could I not use it? You know, and you're going to see at the end of the presentation, you know, whether you're going to adopt these technologies, really comes down to like a personal risk management decision. You know, am I getting more? then I may potentially lose a result of implementing this technology. But you know, as we move to the smart home especially, um, there are going to be some security concerns, especially if your voice-based assistant technology can, you know, some hacker can come in and say, you know what, unlock the back door, right, without you even knowing about it, right? And not to say, you know, if they can access your accounts, look at your patterns by looking at your use or non-use of certain technologies, right? You know, we've heard this a long time ago. If you see that in some of these devices that, that maybe, you know, the refrigerator hasn't opened in a couple of days when it's used to being opening, that you can surmise that the person is not home, okay? Well, you know, with these technologies, you can do the same thing. You'll be able to do them remotely. Um, so when we look at a, a typical voice control system, there's gonna, you see there's going to be three parts to it. There's going to be the voice capture piece, um, which really happens at the local device, okay? It's going to capture that voice. And then the speech rec recognition piece, Part of it can occur on the device, and part of it can occur on the cloud, depending on the solution. But you'll notice that the very famous wake word is, is part of the speech recognition technique, right? Hello, hey Siri, right? You know, with that wake word is what uh, basically causes the device to basically start recording. Because these devices are always listening, right? And you'd agree they have to listen, because if they're not listening, how can they listen? You know, here you say the wake word to activate itself. And then we have um, a, a, a portion of programming where it recognizes the voice. And what we're moving with the, uh, the technologies today, earlier technologies couldn't recognize individual voices. Now they can, right? Starting in October 2017 last year, Amazon Echo started to recognize specific devices in the home. So if I said on my Echo show, call mom, okay, it would know, you know that it was my mom, okay, as opposed to my son saying it and calling his mother, which was my wife. Okay, so these these uh, technologies are getting getting more and more mature um, over time, and then we have the command execution part, and this is after you uh, 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 after the recognition piece is going to uh, perform some kind of operation, and this is one way to to view it logically here. Like I said, the voice capture piece on the left, this is done on the local device here. The speech recognition piece here can be done on a local device or it can be done in the cloud. And then basically on the cloud, though, this is going to happen. I said something's going to launch or some action is going to be performed. Okay. So one thing about this technology is part of the IoT, right? Internet of things or Internet of terrible. Okay. I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, I find this, you know, this is the thing about IoT. I will admit to you that we do a terrible job securing the devices we have. And you're going to give us another how many billion devices to secure? You know, I mean, would you agree? I mean, how many of you 
feel like you're doing their job well. And so, like, let me rephrase that, because I know you're all doing your job well, but are properly, or honestly, are keeping your networks properly secured, or systems properly secured. Can you really say you are? 100% of my customers have been hacked. 100%. And I live in Washington, D.C., a target-rich environment. Some of those attackers were APTs, without a doubt. They've been identified as advanced persistent threats from nation states. But you know what? I don't really feel bad, right? Because I'm not responsible for whether a user clicks on an attachment. You know, we try to minimize that. I'm not responsible for the vulnerabilities or the O days that may have been exploited in a Windows operating system, correct? So, I mean, I don't, we're not, we can't even secure the stuff that we have now. Now we're going to be throwing, throwing at us all these little devices that are going to be entering our workplace. And I'll tell you right now, it's just not going to happen. Okay, so it really does concern me. But um, devices like the Amazon Echo are full under what we call the Internet of Things. Now, this technology was released in, in late 2014. And really, the whole convenience part of it was that it was hands-free. Okay, um, allows you to, um, you know, uh, basically, you know, today, manage your home, right? Um, one of the, the interesting parts about it was the, the voice known as Alexa, okay? And the Alexa basically is the cloud piece. It is the AI piece in the Amazon architecture. Now, this list keeps growing, all these options. When I first started with the, Am the Echo, it was just the Echo. Now in my home, I have, I'll tell you what I have. I start off with one Echo in our bedroom. Then I added a spot to my bedroom, just a different section of the bedroom, okay? Um, then I have an Echo Show in my little, and by the way, if you want the presentation, I'll be more than happy to give this to you. No need to write anything down. Um, I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, I have an Echo Show. Um, I have an, another Echo in the kitchen because my wife's from Latin America and she likes to listen to that Latin American music, you know what I'm saying? And, and then, you want to see that again? <laughs> no, no, you don't. <laughs> and then in the basement, we have an Echo Dot because that's where my kids are and, you know, it's a cheap solution. So pretty much I have them scattered around the house and we're seeing more and more, uh, uh, I guess, more variations of these devices. And one thing that's really good about them is prices coming down dramatically, right? You can get an Echo Dot, I think, for $49 today. It's pretty inexpensive, okay? So setting these up is really easy. And I have this up here because I started wondering this setting up. It says, when you first set up one of these devices, you connect to a Wi-Fi signal emitted by the Echo. Then you set up the device with the mobile app, the Alexa app, right? Then it, you, it connects to the Wi-Fi network, gets an IP address via JCP, and then it can be used as long as internet connectivity is provided. If you lose internet connectivity, you have a problem, right? Typically, the Echo will show us a little light. Uh, I forget what the color is. That there's no connectivity, but guess what? You know, she's not going to tell you the time. She's not going to do any of the stuff she's designed to do. But I look at that first one there, and I said, wow, it's emitting a, a Wi-Fi signal, which means it's also an access point. Anybody think about that? It's an access point. Hmm, something to look at in the future, right? And it's already connected to my home network via Wi-Fi. Okay, so, um, you know, the way that you manage the devices typically is you have three ways to manage them. You can do it from the device itself. That means touching the device itself. So have certain buttons that you can touch if you want to increase audio, uh, or lower the volume, etc. If you just wanted to turn it off, right? There are certain instances where people are kind of a little concerned about what Amazon can hear, and they'll actually go out and turn off the uh, uh, the echo, you know, you can you can turn off the speaker or you can unplug it. How many of you would be concerned about the echo listening to what's going on in your bedroom and you not knowing about it? Is there any activity in your bedroom? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Just asking. All right. Uh, uh, you can use the mobile app and you can use the web browser itself. And what's good about the mobile app and the web browser basically is two duplicate interfaces. If you want to find out a, a device's MAC address, this is where you go. And this is where I went because I wanted to sniff some of the traffic on my Echo. And I wanted to use Wireshark, so basically I said, let me go find out the MAC address so I can set a display, I mean, I'm sorry, a capture filter based on MAC address. Didn't see very much uh, because it's all, you know, SSL encrypted traffic, okay? But, uh, you know, in the future that doesn't mean that, you know, something, <laughs> there may not be some vulnerability that we may be able to exploit. So, you know, basically when it comes to the technology itself, like SSL, that stuff pretty, is pretty solid, but it's the implementation of the security technology that usually someone tries to break. So I want to just give you an, uh, just a rough idea of, you know, physically what the Echo looks like. Notice there's an on-off button. You can turn the Microsoft uh, on and off. The volume uh, ring button, uh, so you can adjust volume on the top. Um, an action button. Uh, 
So if you're going to if you ask it to wake you up at six in the morning and you want to turn off the timer, you can do that. The power LED um, will also give you the power, uh, the status of the Wi-Fi at the time, and the light ring. And this is the light ring is what we typically use for troubleshooting here. If you see that that blue thing lit that lit up on the top there, and Amazon's nice enough to give you all what all the lights mean, okay? Um, and especially when it's not you know getting any kind of network connectivity. So it's a good for troubleshooting. Although what I have found with my Echo, I have very few problems with my Echo. You know, has anybody had any problems with their Echo? I mean, it seems to just operate. Now, there's not a lot of complexity going on there, and if I do have problems, it really has to do with understanding my commands. Although I have had problems with uh, Alexa just talking without anybody saying anything. Has anybody experienced that? Yeah, that's kind of creepy. I don't know what that's all about. It'll say something. Uh, and, and, and the thing is, my wife is a conspiracy theorist. Theorist, okay. theorist, theorist, whatever. She likes conspiracies. And when that happens, it just really causes a problem with me and my wife and my relationship with, uh, with Alexa. You know, she just thinks, wow, they're listening, listening to us. No matter how many times she hears me say this talk, she still believes we're being, you know, everything we're doing in our bedroom is being listened to. Not that there's a lot going on there. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, the thing is about these devices um, is that the, the voice service itself is what we call as Alexa. And this is the service that's in the cloud. Okay, you know, what you say to the Amazon is picked up at the device, but then it's sent into the cloud for processing. And this really is where most of the work is being done. And, and these, I like this technology, and I think it should be of interest to you too, because we're seeing the Alexa technology being implemented in other things, like I mentioned before, cars. Okay, you know, you know for a smart home. So this is definitely, I think, a technology you're going to have to be familiar with in the future. So this is a, just a, a screen grab of the Amazon Alexa app, and which is how we used to manage our Amazon Echo. And I said before, this allows you to view your device's MAC address. So if you want to do any sniffing, you can do that. But how about this one? View your request history. Okay. What people don't realize is that on the Echo, everything you say to the Echo is saved until it's deleted. Anybody use CCleaner here? No, you guys know what CCleaner is? I use it every day, and there's a reason for that. There is no CCleaner for the Echo. So people are surprised when they access you know, this management application, they can see every, everything they've said to the Echo over time. Now, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of it is innocuous today. Okay. But what if there is eventually, as this technology migrates, there might be sensitive information there that may be of use to a threat actor? So the way it works is typically that the Echo is going to listen for the user's voice and to respond for commands. Like I said, commands like play some kind of music, read the morning headlines. Okay, um, I know I like to when I wake up in the morning say play NPR. Okay, don't have to get up. I'm half asleep. I just have to say play NPR. I don't have to get up and do anything. Or maybe guess what? You can do things like also add um, uh, events to your calendar. You can integrate that with the Alexa. Um, you can also I mean, I'll tell you. I mean, there's so many things you can do. This is expandable. Um, you know, they have these things called skills apps that you can add to the Amazon Alexa to uh, uh, increase its functionality. Um, you know, it will read emails to you if you want to with a skill. So, you know, no need to even read anymore. It'll actually read it to you verbally. So, you know, where this technology really is going to end up is kind of limitless here. And um, notice that it says, once again, it's going to stream this audio to this cloud-based storage, which is Alexa, once it detects its wake word. And because it's connected to the cloud, it's always getting smarter. What do you think about that? Yeah, because essentially what's happening is now Amazon, just like Google, <laughs> is collecting all this information about us. Although before, with, and you know, even Google now, because of the Google uh, voice-based assistance too, but before we used to be concerned that Google knew you know, who our contacts were through our calendar. They're seeing our browsing habits. They're seeing our shopping habits. You know, we're really, all this is doing is really furthering that situation because if you have an Amazon Prime account, how much does Amazon know about you? Right, I, I don't know, I have an Amazon Prime account. I refuse to use other services because of the free shipping. And plus I paid for it. But they have access to every little thing I purchased from these, what's this little thing that you had here before? From my fidget spinners? Aren't you a little too old for this? <laughs> But you think about it, do so they understand my reading habits, the videos that we purchase? You know, really in-depth, sophisticated personal profiles are being uh, developed on us, okay, through our shopping habits, okay? So we, I call it the ecosystem, and uh, this is basically all the components that you're going to find in the Amazon Alexa ecosystem. Uh, this is here, the, your, your Alexa-enabled devices, whether it's a spot or a dot or it's a, a, an echo show. And when it, it's going to send its information via the, a network, right, 
typically the internet to the Alexa cloud here. And you'll notice that you will be able to manage also these devices through these companion clients. This is just the, like the, the app, mobile app. So basically, this is the direction it's going to go. Everything is moving through the Alexa cloud. Now, added to this are third-party apps. Say, for example, you started, you're creating a smart home, right? And you know, you've got your Philips light bulbs and other things. Well, essentially, this is integrated with the cloud also, too. So just something to keep in mind. So that means that really this here Okay, it's collecting a lot of detailed information about you. And the question is, do you trust Amazon? Do you trust Amazon? I'm just curious. Do you trust Amazon? I don't know. Maybe you trust Amazon, but you know what I found, you know, in my years of cyber, there are a lot of people I trust that wind up getting broken into by someone I don't trust. Okay? And how is that information going to be used potentially? Is there anybody you don't trust? Can you say that? Is this being recorded? Is the government listening? Is Amazon listening? All right, just wondering. <laughs> oh, that's my wife. <laughs> so, believe you don't want to hear that. Believe me. So um, the question is: Is, is uh, Alexa always listening? Yes, it always is, and it has to listen because it has to listen for the wake word. And all these technologies do the same thing. The question is: Is it always recording? And it's not always recording. Okay. So um, it says the Echo keeps less than sixty seconds of recorded sound in its storage buffer. As new sound is recorded, the old is erased. There is no audio record made of what went on in a room where the echo sits. Now, that doesn't mean that that can't be done later, if you know what I'm talking about. Okay. What if you were, I don't know, some terrorist, I hate using that word, but you know, you're someone that's being seen by a threat, and law enforcement goes to Amazon. And you know they have they've done this before. Say, can you push an update to this Echo? Sound familiar? Apple, right? Push an update to this Echo so that you can actually record everything that's going on in this household. Okay. You know, I don't. What's preventing that from happening? Maybe you know, I guess current uh, legislation. But you know, it is possible if that's something that they wanted to do. Now, once the he Echo he is going to hear its wake word, okay. It's going to stream this audio to the cloud, and that's where it's going to be processed using machine languages and other technologies. Okay? But remember, it's ephemeral. It's not there all the time. So let's talk about some of the security issues with respect to uh, voice-based assistance. And um, there are a couple of attacks. I'm going to talk about something in particular called the Dolphin attack, because the Echo is a wireless device. So if you want to compromise it, probably the best way to compromise it is wirelessly. Right? It supports Wi-Fi. It supports Bluetooth. Now, it can be com uh, uh, compromised physically, but what's the big drawback with trying to compromise something physically? You got to have physical access, absolutely. So, and then that, you know, that's a little more dangerous for you, right? You know, when we, I talk to my students, oh, my students want to be red teamers. Anybody here want to be a red teamer? Anybody a red teamer? Nobody's a red teamer? You're just, just too ashamed to say it. <laughs> no. Well, I, I, you know, everybody wants to be a red teamer because it's sexy. Right, and they want to do that, you know. But I always tell them, I mean, you know, the stuff that you see in TV with these physical attacks, nobody wants to do that. There's cameras everywhere, right? And they'll see you coming from, you know, uh, I guess blocks away. But essentially, um, uh, what if we could tell our um, Echo to, uh, 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 can tell an iPhone to call this certain number, okay, or iPad or FaceTime a number? I have to be honest with you. Last night, my daughter is uh, house sitting for us, and I was really tempted to remotely access my Echo devices and start playing weird music. But I didn't do it. We, my wife told us not to do it. But that can be done if we wanted to do that. Okay. How about this one? What if you could force a device to open a known malicious website? What? I can't download the get the malware on this guy. He's just not falling for those phishing emails. Well, guess what? Maybe I can just force his browser when he's not around to go to that malicious website and download an exploit kit. That would be possible. How about this one? Order an Amazon Echo to open the back doors I mentioned before. Or open a window. Or how about turn off a camera? Right, if anybody has cameras in their home, right? So especially if they're motion sensor type cameras, what if you just want to turn it off? Okay. Um, or can have an Audi Q3's navigation system redirected to a new location. Right? We've always been hearing about you know these problems that we're going to have with these connected vehicles, but you know outside of the Wired magazine articles where they're being driven off the road or the movies where they're coming off of parking garages. But yeah, that really concerns me because you know what? I love this technology. I mean, think about it. I'm 56 years old. I know I don't look it <laughs> look much younger, but when I was a kid, I mean, th th <laughs> I know I look worse. I know. Uh, <laughs> my wife tells me. But the thing is, when I was a kid, 
These technologies that we're seeing today, I never thought I'd be alive to see. I mean, autonomous vehicles, how cool is that? I mean, am I, I mean I'm overwhelmed by how cool I think that is. Okay? All these technologies like AI, robotics, you know, when I first saw my Boston Dynamics robot get knocked down, ever see that video where they knocked the robot down? I felt bad for the robot. I don't know if you did, because I had sympathy for the robot. But you know, we've seen these technologies, they're, they're hitting us at a very, very fast pace, and like a lot of other technologies, we're really not thinking about the security implications of them. Why? Because that's not of concern to most businesses, right? I own a business, I work for businesses. When you're trying to develop a product, what are you trying to do? You want people to buy your product. Because if it's not, you know, just so that you can justify all the expenses later, which in security is usually one of them. Because if people are not buying the product, then you're not going to have any business. So let's talk about this uh, uh, a dolphin attack. Um, and essentially, um, this attack, as it says here, is, uh, can talk to voice assistants by speaking with a voice that people cannot hear. Basically, ultrasound commands inaudible to the human ear. Anybody ever blow into a dog whistle? That's what we're talking about. Okay. We're talking about frequencies above 20 kilohertz that only certain devices could hear. Okay. And it's usually all of the um, uh, voice-based assistant type devices. So it was tested against 16 devices, okay, included Windows 10, Alexa, etc. And notice it was successfully attested in different languages. English, Chinese, German, French, and Spanish. So it wasn't just limited to English. So the attack allows an adversary to talk to voice control devices, which will then obey the commands. And it could take over your phone, your computer, your gaming console, your watch, a car, in this case the Audi, or your hands-free voice assistant. And this can all be happening in the background while you're sitting with your device. Okay? And in this case here, it could be your mobile phone. So some example of attacks, right? Have Siri initiate a FaceTime call like I mentioned before. Um, get Google now to switch a phone to airplane mode, which really would be equivalent of a denial of service. Okay, Manipulate the navigation system of an Audi right, to take you someplace other than where you wanted to go. Or direct a device to visit, visit a malicious website that can do the following. Install an exploit kit on the victim's computer. Send fake emails or text messages. Place fake comments on a website. Enroll the victim's device in a botnet. Do you see the problems of this here? Okay, now, you know, I, I don't know how serious you may think these, some of these things are, and, and, and I know up, up in certain environments where I work in Washington, D.C., some of these things would be a bigger deal than the other, okay? But, you know, basically what you're doing, you're talking about poning, you're, you're poning a device, essentially. And you know what happens when someone pones the device? Well, you know, really no longer own it, or you're in co-ownership with them. Okay, so uh, what this is talking about, and I said, for those of you who get the presentation, you can go to this website, and it's going to show you what uh, 20 kilohertz of sound sound likes. But basically, what it's what it's doing is it's they can register sounds above 20 kilohertz, and this is the problem. While it's inaudible to us, all these voice-based assistants can hear commands at that frequency. Okay, so notice it uses ultrasonic frequencies that lie above the range of human hearing to communicate with the voice recognition systems that power many popular voice-based assistants. Okay, and basically they can say the command at this frequency and it's going to carry out the command. Yes, sir? Yes, you're right. There are some frequencies that, that uh, and I can't remember the number, but you're right. 18. Okay, there are some frequencies that we can't hear, but children can hear. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, in your case especially. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so how can you deliver this attack? Okay, so, well, a portable attack systems powered by low-watt amplifiers can be used to access devices within relatively short ranges. Okay, so, for example, somebody sits next to you at a coffee shop like Starbucks, okay, and they can be speaking silently to your cell phone, watch or laptop. Think about it. Now, when you look at this attack, though, what I've noticed is you have to be pretty close. When they did this research, um, it was really no more than two yards. So that's pretty close. I don't know if I'd feel, I mean, maybe you can get away with that. And then there's the issue of background noise. This is very sensitive to background noise when they do these, this research. Basically, it's not a lot of background noise. But think about it in a busy coffee shop. You have to wonder if, about its effectiveness. But over time, I could see this getting better. Yes, sir? Yeah, it has, it has nothing to do with who's speaking. 
It's just the whole idea of um, that whatever's being said would be done at a different frequency that could be unheard. So you could be saying it, I could be saying it. That's fine because when you typically what it's doing, it's cust it's customizing, right? So uh, I mean, it's it's still going to work. That, that's the bottom line. It's it's just going to work. I'm not going to say call mom. It, uh, no, but it, I'll tell you now, it, depending on the voice-based assistance, yeah, the, it would matter, but not in all of them. I know Siri would matter, okay? Siri would matter, but not all of them. Yeah, yeah, that, you can also try to brute force stuff. And if the thing is, what I've learned, if it's a, th a determined threat actor, and I don't know how determined the threat actors are here. I know where I work in Washington, they're determined. You know, and you know, and I've you know, when you think about maybe there's something they're not going to do that they're going to do, but yeah, depends on the solution. Yeah, because right, Siri probably wouldn't fall for that. <laughs> um, and in audible commands, look at this one: embedded in uh, videos that are played at home, and any voice assistant in the room that hears the video can be affected. So this is a really determined threat actor. And there's an example for this, right? So I don't know if you remember this story that happened uh, last year where there was a newscaster talking about this cute little girl here. She's so cute right there. And she ordered, I don't know, how many pounds of uh, cookies and do a dollhouse from uh, 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 Amazon Prime, right? But it turned out when the, a newscaster repeated it in the news, okay, I think it was in San Diego, everyone who had that news program turned on the time got a dollhouse and cookies delivered to them from Amazon Prime, okay? So there's a precedent for this, actually. Now, you know, obviously this is an innocent mistake, okay? But I said, if there's a determined threat actor, what if I could just click, a, you know, send you a link with a video with audio? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wow. Wow. What do you think of that, guys? That's pretty interesting. Yes, sir. Yes, you can, but it's on by default. That's the thing. You have to be smart enough to go turn it off. I have it turned on because I love that feature, honestly. Yeah, but most people who this happened to didn't even know they had that feature turned on by default. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's one of the fixes. But that when this was done, that was not that was not done. I mean, they, they why do you need to listen to frequencies above twenty kilohertz, right? And this is the thing, as these technologies evolve, as these attacks take place, you know, you got to remember, security is very reactive, right? Do, do you agree? I mean, I know we don't spend the money on security, we don't have to, usually after some compromise, something. And it's the same thing for these guys, right? You know, they're just putting it out there. It, to some extent, it becomes a risk management based decision. Who's going to think up of this idea that somebody's going to try to send an inaudible command over 20 kilohertz? Once it's discovered, then, the, the, then they patch it. But, you know, it's a, I think it's an interesting attack because, you know, it, you know, this is to me, I consider this an air gap network. And we just figured out a way to get, a, get through an air gap network. Yes, sir. and causing the devices to enter a space that it should not. All it's doing is they were listening to frequencies above 20 kilohertz, which they shouldn't have. And what the researchers did were send commands that we normally would have done as a normal voice command over those frequencies. And essentially the device would obey them. Yeah. And, and I think I have a picture. Oh, oh, by the way, kind of really, I guess a little really too, but how, I don't know if you heard about this case here where, uh, um, and Burger King released a TV ad that triggered the Google Assistant. The ad ended with a person saying, okay, Google, what is the Whopper Burger, which is designed to trigger any Google Assistant devices like Android phones and Google Home to read aloud a description of the hamburger's ingredients. So this one is quite, not quite not as, not as surreptitious as your example, but you know, you could see that this is also being used by advertisers, and, and why not, you know? Um, th by the way, this was, they got some really bad press as a result of this. I mean, they were, uh, uh, a lot of people weren't happy that did this. But I want to, this is a, a picture of the research this was done. But I want you to note the distance, okay? 
pretty close. Okay, so I'm a pretty practical kind of guy. I'm not a researcher. I, I, and I'm thinking, you know, how's somebody going to pull this off in the real world? And I just kind of thought that it would, this was kind of close. Doesn't mean over time, okay, that they can't lengthen that. But then you have the issue of background noise. Then you have the issue of basically filtering on stuff about 20 kilohertz. But I still thought this was an interesting attack nonetheless. Okay. So even Siri was susceptible. Now, how do we defend against this, essentially? Um, you can uh, 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 turn off uh, the voice activation function on their devices, or basically just configure the devices so they don't recognize audio signals above 20 kilohertz. So I don't know what the progress has been on that among these companies, but I know a lot of companies, this is, was a very famous attack on the X Alexa that got people concerned, because I think nobody would ever thought of it. Now, there were a bunch of researchers from the Citadel who were able, basically able to uh, uh, get root on an echo using its troubleshooting, uh, 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 I guess, a troubleshooting feature. So um, if you look at the bottom of an echo, it's actually going to look like this. And then I'm going to focus on these pieces here. So what they were able to do um, to gain root access to the device, basically using those pins. Okay. The problem with this, and you know, once you get root access to the device, well, what if you wanted to store some kind of malicious software? You know, Once again, the challenge is, is that this is a very sophisticated attack, and you have to get root uh, physical access to the device, which is always um, a little risky. But the, their thinking was, well, guess what? Maybe eventually it can be automated. And as I said, once you get root access to anything, then you've got a problem. Blueborn. Did anybody have to deal with Blueborn? Was it last fall, last October? Yeah. Did that make people nervous here? Anybody nervous? Yeah. Blueborn should have made you very nervous, okay? Because the reason this was such an effective attack is because it affected almost every device that supported Bluetooth. It didn't, it was a worm. It didn't require any action on the user other than someone being infected, walking near someone who also has another Bluetooth device, and they would get infected, okay? By the way, this was like, I think there were eight zero day vulnerabilities associated with this, okay? So think about this. You have a delivery man with a phone infected. They walk into your office, okay, or near your office where there are other Bluetooth devices. Say it's a, somewhat of a security area. They can't go all the way in, but, you know, as they're delivering something where the guard is, okay, and they're dropping it off, it affects maybe a, 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 a wireless uh, keyboard, okay. That's close enough to infect another device as someone walking by, and they w uh, walk into the office, right? And guess what? Now it starts infecting all the other devices without doing anything. You know, you, you don't even have to be paired with the device. What's interesting about this attack here is that, like I said, all these zero days, but the Echo was vulnerable to this, okay? You notice these CVEs now, one of them had a CVSS score of 8.8, .8, which is rather high. Another one was only 6.5, which is medium. But guess what? Also, Google Home was vulnerable. So this is the thing, that you also have to think about patching your, <laughs> your voice-based assistants. I mean, you know, I don't know how many of your organizations, uh, you know, do BYOD, right? But, you know, but you've got to make, I mean, I don't know how you make sure your users patch their phones. I mean, do, do you have a way of assuring your users patch their phones? How often do you patch your Bluetooth mouse? <laughs> you know, you think about it. So this is a very serious vulnerability, but you know, um, you know, voice-based assistants, especially the Echo, were susceptible to it. I thought this was an interesting case because this was uh, um, had to do, uh, I guess, people learned whether Echo was really listening or not. And what happened here? This was in Arkansas, and this guy killed this hot guy in the hot tub of that house. And the story was that. Um, I guess apparently he drowned in the hot tub, but p police wanted to get access to the Echo because they wanted to see if there was inf any information that was being recorded. Essentially, Amazon said no. Okay, They actually argued, look at this, on the bottom bullet there, Amazon declined to provide the data arguing that Alexa speech is protected by the First Amendment. Okay. So they, now, not that they had anything to give, but they argued this and basically said they had no legal standing and didn't provide that information. So I think, though, he's going to be arrested without that information. Apparently, police were using the water meter, meter were able to determine that there was an excessive use of n normal water use. Apparently, that indicated that he was cleaning up the crime scene at the time. So they can use other technologies to convict him. But I thought that was really interesting. Amazon refused to do it, and, uh, and they said, why? And then this incident happened. The Google, Google Home Mini Speaker, I have oops. They had sent some demo devices to some people who were evaluating this device. And guess what? Apparently, the, the, the button on top of it 
Well, when you pushed it, it never got like unpushed, and it started recording everything. Okay, very bad PR for Google. They basically disabled that feature through a software update, um, and uh, uh, can't use it. So they said that was a, le a legitimate mistake. It has something to do with the mechanics of, of, of pushing to talk, and there's some articles on that. Now, how about this here? Is we're introducing this technology to our kids' toys. Now, I don't know about you, but my kids are pretty computer savvy. Okay, I have a, I think my, my now nine-year-old son, he had his first iPad when he was four. Why? Because they were getting our trickle-down devices. I said my wife is a senior security engineer at Jamalto, and she's, we got technology all over the place. I can't, you know, one time I started to count all the Apple devices we had in our home. I reached 15. I had no idea we had fifth, just Apple devices, 15 Apple devices in our home. So they're pretty computer savvy. But as these technologies are integrated into our toys, and this was one famous example by Kayla, okay, that it was recording conversations of our children. Who knows how they're going to be used, but you've got to be concerned about it. So what we're seeing now, we're seeing people who are very interested in, uh, I guess, establishing privacy type regulations with respect to uh, these type of technologies. And we have the formation of this voice privacy industry group that was founded recently. And it's basically, you know, they want to basically, uh, they're pushing for, I guess, clear le legal mandates for the use of this technology. So is Alexa your friend or foe? Well, you know, and I've said this before, really, it's a personal risk management decision. In my opinion, you know, it's so compelling to use these technologies, all of these technologies. Um, you know, you've got to make your own decision. Now, now what happens when it's a, entering a corporate environment? You know, what, what's going to be the impetus for getting it there and managing it there? So I have here, and I added this just for fun. If you, if those of you get the presence, click on this. Have anybody seen this video? Alexa, are you connected to the CIA? Well, she, she, uh, there's someone on the video was asking Alexa, she's connected to the CIA, and it basically turned itself off after asking that question. So it's really kind of funny. So if you want this, I'll send it to you. you can, it's, it's worth listening to that video. And these are some of the references I used in this presentation. If you want to say, if you get the presentation, I'll send it to you. Any questions? <laughs> okay, I did it on time. Thank you for coming. Have a good one. Thanks for having me. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it.